Hi, my name is Chris Bailey, and in this CG cookie tutorial, we're going to be making Pong using Blender. Let's jump into it. Go check out our fundamentals of animation in Blender course on cgcookie.com, or if annual membership isn't your thing, you can find the course as a standalone product on the Blender market. Links are in the description below. So this is going to be an intro to animation, sort of a basic first steps tutorial. And this is going to hopefully set you up so you can be an explore animation experiment with it yourself. Now we're going to be using the Pong scene that we built in the previous tutorial. If you haven't watched that, you can find it here on the channel or you can head over to cgcookie.com to download this project file so that you can use it in this animation tutorial just like I have here. All right, so let's get started and talk about how to animate the scene. So we wanna set up a basic Pong scene. So we're gonna have these uh, little palettes going back and forth and the ball bouncing between them and we'll have the score kind of iterate up. That'll be the goal with this little animation project. So the first thing we should do is go ahead and set our scene up so that it's really easy to work with. Now you should have a timeline down at the bottom of your screen, but if you don't, for some reason, I'll just move my head so you can see this. If you don't have a timeline, let's say for example, we just have uh, the big screen like this here. What you can do is you can always in Blender go to the corners of every viewport and you can see when I reach the corner, I get this little plus icon. Uh, my mouse cursor changes. So I'm gonna go right down here and whenever you click and drag when you've got a plus, it splits your view. And then in this little drop down menu, which is in the top corner of every single window, you can open this up and select what you want to see in that viewport panel. So we can come here and grab the timeline. Um, it's really great. You can also do the opposite. If you wanna get rid of something, you can click and drag down over a window to get rid of it. So that's really helpful. Okay, so first I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my widgets and my handles to make sure everything is visible. I'm also gonna get out of rendered view. There's no need for me to be in rendered view for this. And uh, I'm gonna select my first paddle. And I'm gonna click this button on the playhead to go back to the very first frame of my scene. So what I wanna do first is go ahead and set up, uh, probably the ball actually, probably makes the most sense. Set the ball set up and moving, and then we can animate the paddle moving into position to deflect it. So let's decide where we're gonna put it first. I'm gonna move it on the Y and on the X, and uh, I might just start it right about here, let's say. Now, I wanna set a keyframe for this position. Now, what do I mean by that? A keyframe is basically a point on your timeline where some value is saved for your object that you have selected. In our case, we want it to be in this position. So we wanna go over to the object properties and have a look at the location and the rotation. We're not really gonna to be touching the rotation of the scale, so we don't have to worry about keyframes there. But right here, the location, we want it to start in this position. So if we set a keyframe, and this is a many ways to do it. One way we can click on these little dots and when they turn yellow, you can see we get this appearing here in our timeline as well. This is a keyframe and it's gone yellow showing us there's a keyframe on this frame for these values. Another way of doing it is right clicking and you can insert a single keyframe if you just wanna do one track or you can right click and insert keyframes. It'll keyframe everything for that specific set of uh, inputs. Another way of doing it is in the viewport. We come over here and hit I and it gives us this drop down menu. We can say what it is we actually want a keyframe. So I want to keyframe the location. And boom, you can see it does the exact same thing. We can also, over here, last way I'm going to show you is just hover your mouse over these numbers and hit I, and it will also set a keyframe for all those. So there's lots of ways to do it, but they're all doing exactly the same thing, which is setting this point, this little diamond here on our timeline. And if I open up, you can see the ball is the object that we have selected and it's action here under the object transforms, you can see the X, Y, and Z location each have a keyframe. Now, why do we get all these extra keyframes? And it seems like this is a lot of keyframes for just three values. This summary basically shows us that, hey, there's a keyframe, some keyframes somewhere on this frame for this object. And if there's any keyframes anywhere, you get a, a key appearing in the summary. It's sort of your top level view. If we open it up, you can think about the ball now, it's showing us, hey, if we have multiple objects selected, so like we have a paddle, let's say, and a ball, you can see the paddle's not listed because there's no keyframes for that paddle. But if we had several things, they'd be all listed here. And uh, so really what this is showing us is that these three keyframes are the ones with the actual data down at the bottom. And then up above is just showing us, hey, we've got something here in this section. Okay, we're gonna move forward in our timeline now. So where do we want the ball to kind of reach the point where this guy's gonna get, gonna have to hit it? So I'm gonna hit play by pressing spacebar or by pressing on this button here. And maybe a bit further, maybe frame 40. I'm just trying to sense how long do I want it to travel. So I'm gonna grab it now and I'll bring it over here. Let's say, let's bring it up to about, about here, 
right here. Okay. Now, a couple things have changed. These values have turned orange, and this one's now green. This is telling me that there's no keyframe here. None of these are yellow. So this is a nice little visual representation telling me, hey, there's no keyframe. And the orange means you've changed these values. So these values are different than the original keyframe. Green means it's the same. It hasn't changed. So this is kind of a little warning saying, hey, you don't want to lose this value. You've set this new value. Be sure to set a keyframe for it. And it hasn't set a keyframe automatically for us. So if I move my timeline now that I've placed it, it's going to snap back to the old position because that's the last place we actually set an actual keyframe for it. So if I wanted to actually stay where I've put it, bring it right back up here again, I need to go ahead and set a new keyframe for those two values. So now that I've done that, you can see what is Blender doing? It's actually interpolating in between these two for me. So if I press play, you can see it moves up. Now we can click on the summary if I drop, so I'm just looking at the summary. I could click on one of these guys and drag it. You'll see it takes all the other keyframes underneath it. So now if I grab this set of keyframes, and move it around, uh, you know, I can get a different sense of timing. So maybe drag it out closer to 70. It looks pretty good. Okay, so let's move the paddle now to line up with this guy. You'll notice that when I click away from the cube, everything disappears in my uh, timeline. So it only is going to show me the objects that I've selected. Those are the only ones that are going to show up the keyframes in here. So it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, let's say we start the paddle here. So I'll go back to my first frame. And I'm going to come over here and just hit I over that to set a keyframe for all those. And now I want to come to the same point where it kind of intersects. So I'm going to select the cube, find the keyframe. There it is right here. 72 is the frame. Now I'm going to grab my paddle and G for grab and Y to lock it on Y. And I'll bring it up here so that it lines up with the paddle. Then I'm making sure I don't forget. Remember, it's green and orange over here. We need to make it yellow. So I'm going to come over here and just click a button there to set a key. Or I could set I to set one for all of it, even though these values aren't changing. So there we go. Now I've got two keys for this. So now I paddle moves up as the ball comes into place. And then it hits. So once it hits, let's make it bounce. So I'm going to go over here, maybe to frame 140, let's say. And we'll grab this. And actually, I'm going to have it go up like this and then bounce back down. So maybe about halfway, let's say. Let's grab it. And then I'll just say, let's say it goes up here. And I'll hit I to set a keyframe. And then we come over here. And let's grab another keyframe, uh, maybe all the way down here. And hit I again. Or we can hit I in the timeline and the viewport and do the location. All right, so we're getting lots of keyframes. Now we've got this interesting line that's appeared here. This is something new. So what is this telling us? If we look at the Z location, so it's just the Z location that's making this happen. If I double click it, it's going to select all the keyframes for the Z location for this object. Let's have a look at what the Z location is doing. I can use the up and down arrows on my keyboard to cycle between the next and previous keyframe. So Z over here is zero, right? So if I go to this next one, it's still zero. And there's no keyframe here. So you can see it's not yellow, it's green. And there's a keyframe here. So it's yellow, but it's also zero. So this line tells us these values are all the same. So whenever a keyframe has the same value as a keyframe before or after it, it will draw this sort of highlighted line between the two of them. And this is a bit of a clue that you can use to help clean up your keyframes or just visually see what's happening in your animation. So I could come here, for example, and hit X to delete this keyframe on the Z location, and it will get rid of that key. And we still have that orange line because this value and this value stay the same. All right, so let's play this animation and have a look at it. All right, so it's cool, but it's not quite right, right? So what's wrong? Well, right here, when the ball bounces, it doesn't really bounce. It kind of slows down and curves, and we didn't really tell it to do that. We just set a position here. So why are we getting all this extra motion? Well, that's because Blender is automatically interpolating keyframes using a Bezier interpolation. So that sounds confusing. Let me show you what it really looks like. We're going to switch from the timeline view over to the graph editor. Now, the graph editor is going to show us our keyframes, but in a different format. It's going to show us in a graph format. So if I open this up, we can have a look. We've got the X, the Y, and the Z location. And you can see the Z location, nothing's changing. It just stays flat. But the Y changes a lot. So this is where the value over time changes. It goes up on the Y and down. And you can see on the X, it does the same. Now. We don't really want it to be curved like this, these, these gradual curves. You can see when we come to this, this paddle, 
you know, it's going to slow down as it curves and then it's going to slowly move up in the other direction. What we wanted to do is hit the paddle and immediately just move in a straight line. So we need these curves to be straight, basically straight lines in between each other. So to do that, what we can do is just select all of them, dragging a box around them. We right click and we're going to have these different options and we want to go with interpolation mode. Bezier is the one I'm telling you, that's the default one. We've got lots of different uh, interpolations, but we're just going to go to linear. Now you can see it makes all these sort of sharp, jagged lines. And let's look and see how that, that changed the motion. So when we come up, this ball is going to hit the paddle and immediately go that way and then down. So it looks a lot better, but the speed's a bit all over the place. So let's try and make that speed consistent. In order to fix this up where it feels like it's going really slow and then really fast, you can see here the X, it's kind of traveling slower here, this lower curve and then it has a stronger slope. So it's traveling over a greater distance over a smaller amount of time. Now I could fix this a couple of different ways. I could actually grab both of these keyframes right here and hit G to grab and X to lock it on the X axis and drag it out till there's not as much difference in this, not as much like a angle difference in this line. And now it's gonna feel a lot similar. So you can see I can change the keyframes by changing their, their graph basically. But I can also switch back over to the timeline. I can change them here as well. So if uh, I feel like this is feeling a bit slow, so I like this bounce douche, but this feels really slow. It's taking, it's not really working for me. I can grab all of these guys right here and just hit S to scale. And it's going to scale them and move them proportionally closer towards my timeline. Now I can move them around until they feel a little bit better. Now this one feels a bit too fast. So I might slow that one down. Bing, bing. All right, let's get some animation on this one, but let's put some life into it. So right here, where it bounces back. Let's say it's going to start to move up. So I'm going to start the keyframe here. I'm going to hit I in my viewport and then set a keyframe to the location. I'm going to go up on the Y a little bit, I location. I'll come down and then I'm going to zoom it right down here, I location, and then make it adjust like they've kind of adjusted a little bit for the position, I location. And then uh, let's take a look at what that looks like. There we go. So now you can see it has a bit more life to it. Now let's say it flings up and really zips this thing with a lot of speed. So right about here, we're at context. I'm going to hit I, location, and then I'll go up a few frames and make it go up here, I, location. So it's going to kind of swipe like that. Honestly, I feel like it's, it's intersecting a little too much. So I'm going to correct it by just pushing this out and then come over here, right click, replace single keyframe. I'll replace that keyframe there. And then let's send it straight back like this, maybe up a little bit, but let's give it a, let's give the other guy, let's give him a point for this one. So I'm going to hit I to set that keyframe. There we go. All right, let's get some life to this one over here. So this thing's going to come down. Let's say he corrects and comes back down. So maybe like I uh, and L for location here. And then I'll have him come down a little bit. G and Y, bring him back down kind of to the center. And then maybe up a little bit, like he's thinking it's going to bounce up here. And then down a little bit. I location. And then he's going to kind of get faked out. So we come here after it hits, bring him up a little bit. And let's say he, he's going to flinch up. So he's going to go up like that. And then he's going to correct and try and zoom down, but not get there in time. So I'm going to bring him right down right about here. Actually, I'll bring him all the way down. And then we'll move that keyframe. Grab this keyframe and move it so that he's not quite covering so it doesn't hit it. Let's see how that looks. If you click this keyframe up here, the one we're at the top, I want to delay it because it feels like it's really slow. I want this to kind of happen from here, but I kind of want him to stay still for a little bit. So I'm going to click on this keyframe. So when he's at this position right here at the top, and I'm going to hit Shift D to duplicate. You can see the same tools that we use in modeling and stuff when we're setting up the scene. We can actually use all those same hotkeys in the timeline. It's going to affect the keyframes in a similar way. 
So I can bring this over here. So now he's going to stay the same. You can see we've got the solid bars across. So we know these values aren't changing. So he stays the same and then he would zoom down. So now I'm going to try and grab both of these guys and find a spot where it makes a little more sense. You know what? I'm watching this. I just don't think it's a fair shot. This guy's going to be able to hit this. So let's get him to hit it. So I'll, uh, I'll let him come up to here, but I'm going to delete that keyframe, delete this keyframe. So he comes up to the top and he comes down and he smashes it. I grab it out a little bit so he gets there just in time. So let's grab this guy. So now, okay, this keyframe that we've set is off screen, right? Oh, I want to change it now. I want it to actually kind of be right there where it needs, right, right, right here at this point where it's hitting the pedal, it's going to get deflected back. So what can I do? Well, I could just insert a keyframe at this point. I can set the exact position I want now and I can hit I and L. So to create this new location keyframe here and I could just delete this old one. So now you can see he's going to hit it. And as soon as he hits there, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to give him a really speedy shot out. And this guy's going to fake out up, I think. So I'll move him all the way out here, I location, and then I'm going to come back kind of halfway, like right about here, I think. And I'm going to grab him on the Y and bring him down to right here. So then I and location, like that. Boom. All right, I want that to go even faster because I want this one to be really hard to hit. So I'm going to grab this final keyframe. Both of these final keyframes. There we go. So now this guy is going to hit it. He'll go up. He comes down and then he goes up. Realized his mistake, comes down to here, but he's not quite fast enough. So I'm going to grab this keyframe, drag it out, and he misses. Let's see if that feels a bit more believable. Hey, now that we've actually had someone score a point, let's animate our number. So this guy scores the point. So right here where it goes off frame, we're going to have this go from a zero to a one. So let's come over to our numbers. I'm going to set a keyframe for the render and the visibility because I want it to basically disappear. So one thing about Blender is you go to this filter button. This will filter all the different kinds of visibilities and stuff. You've got lots of options here, but one of the ones that's automatically turned off by default is this computer icon. If I turn this on, this is basically allowing something to show up in the viewport, which is pretty much the same as the eyeball. The only real difference is this one we can set a keyframe for. Um, it's helpful to kind of animate that so that you've got some visual representation in your viewport, like when something's turned off. So we're going to turn that on first, and then we're going to come here right here at the exact moment where it goes off just before. I'll set a keyframe here for this one and a keyframe here. I'm just hitting I while holding my mouse over these guys. And uh, now you notice we don't get any keyframe information. If I select him, now suddenly it appears. So that's something to keep in mind. Sometimes you have to really make sure you've got them clicked because um, you can just hold your mouse over things and hit I and set keyframes in the viewport like this without actually having it selected. So that might trip you up a little bit if you're not careful. So we're going to go forward. And once it's off screen, I'm going to turn it off in the viewport and turn it off for the render so it won't render. And I'll hit I, so both of those a keyframe. Now, animating visibility can also give some headaches because uh, when it is when it's, when it's invisible, when it's turned off from the viewport, it also is deactivated in the outliner and you can't see it in your timeline. You have to actually go back to a frame where it's visible, then select it, and now you'll be able to see those keyframes. It's kind of frustrating. So just bear that in mind when you're working with uh, visibility. So right here where it goes off, it's going to disappear. And now let's turn on our number one. So I'm going to go to here, make sure it's turned off, and I'll set keyframes for those. And then I'll go forward to here, and I'll turn them back on and hit I for both of those. So, so now they're visible. So it switches from zero to one point. Perfect. All right, great. Now to finish it up, I'll just add a little bit more life to these guys. So let him come back up a little bit. 
and this guy as well, bring him up. And let's turn on Eevee and turn off our controls and our handles. Let's watch our entire scene. Very cool. So it's all working. Looks great. Now, if you want to increase the length of your timeline, say 250 frames isn't quite enough for you, you can extend this out to however many you want. But in my case, 250 are going to work fine. Now, one more thing that could make it really dramatic is if we go to the first frame, set a keyframe for our camera. So select the camera, hit I over location and rotation, go to the last frame. And what we're going to do is open up this side view. If you don't have that, you can also hit in. That will bring it up. That's the hotkey. We're coming right here to view lock. And right where it says lock, we're going to lock, lock the camera to view. So tick that box there. You can hide that menu again with the in key. Now, when we move our viewport display, it's actually going to keep us inside the camera. It's going to take the camera with us. So we can use this to set some cool angles. So you can see I can come down and like kind of drag my camera around, change its position, get something cool set up there. Something like this maybe. Looks nice. And I'm going to hit I. And I again to set two keyframes. And now let's have a look at what that looks like. Very cool. The only problem with this is that we lose the other paddle at this point. So I'm going to come over here and I'll find the moment where I kind of lose it and I want it back right about here, right about in the middle. So we'll go to 120. And I could take my camera and I could just rotate a little bit on maybe the Z and that should get it into view. So I can right click, insert a single keyframe there. And now it should work to keep that paddle in view. Might grab one more right here, really frame it up, insert single keyframe. Looks very cool. One big key with keyframes, you see what I did there, is to not set too many. So don't put too many keyframes down. If you start getting a lot of keyframes, you're going to get curves that look really bad. Now, one little tip to view things, sometimes you can't see everything when you're in the graph mode. So you can see here, I can't see all of my curves. You can hit A to select all and then the full stop or period key on your number keypad and that will zoom everything out. It'd be kind of cool if like the cameraman sweeped the camera here at the end, you know, like he was actually, actually like, you know, trying to keep up with the ball. So like, what if we set a keyframe here on the Z and then we go forward a bit and like rotate back, right? Like that. And then back here. Yeah, that's nice. Makes it feel action packed. Now, if you really, really want to look cool and impress your friends, there's one button you should tick before you hit render. Let's come over here to the camera icon here for the renders. Let's come right down to motion blur, turn that on. Now you're not going to see anything in your viewport for this, but it will appear when you go to render. Just go over to the printer icon. This is our output properties. This is where you can set the resolution of your render. So 1920, 1080, which is the default for HD. Um, and then we can set our frame rate. So 24 frames or 25 or whatever frame rate you want. And we've got our frame start and end, which match here. It's the same. If I change it here, it's going to update here as well. And then we just come over here to the output. Now, this is how we're going to save it out as it's going to save it on default to the temp directory. Um, what I like to do usually is do two forward slashes, and this will save it in whatever directory my project file is saved in. So um, then we can do is type the name of the file. So we'll call this pong underscore render. And there's multiple ways to do renders. Um, I recommend using file format of an image sequence, so something like a PNG or a JPEG. That will render each of these frames as individual JPEGs. And then you can use them later in a compositing tool and bring them all together. But if you just want to get a render out that's a video that you can watch or share online, you want to come over here to FFmpeg video and select that. FFmpeg is a special program that's open source, available free for everyone, and it's included with Blender, and it's used to create different video format outputs. So that's why it's called FFmpeg. And uh, we can open up encoding right here, and there's lots of options. I would recommend going with MPEG-4 to get an MP4 file using the H.264 codec, and the quality is just going to impact the size of the file. So if you need it really small, you want to go for a low, low size, um, and you can really just leave all this stuff as is. 
and we don't have any audio, so don't have to worry about that. And then all we have to do is come here to render and render animation. When I click that, it's gonna automatically start rendering each frame. So now you can see with motion blur turned on, the render looks really good. You get this nice motion blurred effect when the ball zooms off. So I would encourage you to experiment with making uh, a long scene, have several back and forths with the ball. Experiment with using your graph editor and changing the keyframe values here to you know, see how it looks if you change the values. You can also play with these handles to change the way the curves move and stuff. So you can get really interesting motion out of your, out of your animation with these. Um, and then also play with the timeline and moving keyframe sets around to get different timings, different pacings. One other place you can experiment with is the dope sheet. Come over here, it's basically the same as the timeline view that we're looking at. It's just a little bit more information and a little bit of extra controls. Dope Shade's starting to get a bit more advanced in animation, but just know that it's there and it's a very similar uh, editor to the timeline. You can get a lot of the same functionality, but at the beginning, I'd really recommend just stick with the timeline, stick with the curve editor, and you're gonna be great for setting up cool animations. So I hope you really enjoyed this tutorial and you had fun making Pong uh, animate. That's really neat. It's a great place to experiment. Blender's an awesome tool to learn how to do animation. And this could be the first steps for your animation career. Who knows? See how far you can take it. Thanks so much for watching. Hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Ring the notification bell if you wanna find out when we release a new tutorial. And leave us a comment. Tell us what you thought of this tutorial and what you'd like to see in the future. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to check out cgcookie.com. Tons of awesome stuff there. I'll catch you in the next tutorial. Until then, see you later. Bye.